new earth which includes the new Jerusalem and that's what we're singing about come we that love the Lord we're marching upward to Zion the beautiful city of our God let's stand and sing this together 621 disappointed um, with our own surroundings and the sin that is uh, throughout our world um, and oftentimes throughout our, our homes. Lord, we look forward to that day when 
we will no longer be within the presence of sin. And instead, we will be in the presence of our Savior. Lord, we ask tonight that you help us and convict us of where we have replaced you in our hearts for our place of refuge, our place of trust. And we have replaced you with the fear or with worry. We thank you, Lord, that we can trust in you. And we ask, Lord, that you would help us to do so uh, more consistently. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. 532, it says, I am the light of the world, heavenly sunlight, heavenly sunlight. 532. <laughs> chapter 3, uh, near the end of that chapter, to uh, the beginning of Philippians 4, as we think about our citizenship in heaven and the eternal quality of life that we have. Brethren, join in following my example, and note those who so walk as you have us for a pattern. For many walk, of whom I have told you often, and now tell you even weeping, that they are enemies of the cross of Christ, whose end is destruction whose God is their belly, and whose glory is in their shame, who set their mind on earthly things. For our citizenship is in heaven, in which we also eagerly wait for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly body that it may be conformed to his glorious body, according to the working by which he is able to even subdue all things to himself. Therefore, my beloved brethren, and long for brethren, my joy and crown, so stand fast in the Lord, beloved. I implore you, Odia, and I implore Syntyche to be of the same mind in the Lord. And I urge you also, true companion, to help these women who labored with me in the gospel, to Clement also, and the rest of my fellow workers whose names are in the book of life. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say, rejoice. Let your gentleness be known to all men. The Lord is at hand. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Finally, brethren, whatever things are true, whatever things are noble, whatever things are just, 
Whatever things are pure, whatever things are lovely, whatever things are of good report, if there is any virtue and if there is anything praiseworthy, meditate on these things. Things which you learned and received and heard and saw in me, these do. And the God of peace will be with you. Philippians chapter 3, verse 17 through chapter 4. Blessed the Lord be blessed the reading of his word. Next hymn is 508. Tell it to Jesus, tell it to Jesus. 508. opportunity to give. We pray that you would continue to meet the needs of the church and school. Particularly, Lord, we pray that we would see more people saved, that uh, teachers would have a great opportunity this week with the gospel, not only with students, but parents as well. Thank you for the many times that we've been able to share the gospel this year, and for kids who have made professions of faith, and for the evangelistic meetings. We pray, Lord, that we would see hearts begin to open and people would begin to flourish in their relationship with you. Lord, help us to do what really matters and to give of our time, our talent, and even our treasure to what really matters. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 We did have an offertory plan, but our hands got sick. He has, he had a fever this morning. Yeah, he's, he's just going to charge us the usual fee, but <coughs> yeah, he may be back in another day. Mm -hmm. 653 comes from Isaiah chapter 6, where Isaiah responds to God's call and says, Lord, here am I. Any testimonies before we stand in Isaiah 653? All right, let's stand and sing.
little bit washed out there. I should have used a different color. But it says, connecting depression with biblical joy. And our text is Philippians 4, verses 8 through 9. So last week we looked at the idea of depression and how it connects with biblical hope. This uh, week we're looking at how it connects with biblical joy. So depression, we all know, is often a consequence of past hardships. So, so the past, present, future self. That's what we talked about last week. So there are things that we go through in our past that still linger in the present and affect the way that we live. We, we, we can't deny that. And um, it ought to point us toward Christ and toward the future that we have with him, like we were reading about in Philippians and last week in Romans. Uh, but often it doesn't. We kind of get mired down in that. It affects the quality of our life so that we're only looking at the temporal. We're not looking at eternal and so that becomes a problem our citizenship then is right here down below rather than in heaven above and so we don't have the hope to reorient our lives where we need to be we can have that hope again if we'll spend some time thinking on texts like Romans chapter 5 or even here in Philippians chapter 4 I do believe in the 30 years that I've been a Christian that depression is more and more prevalent in our society. There, there can be no doubt about that. I mean, we just see it very plainly. And there are probably many reasons for that. Um, I think that throughout the last four generations, depression has increased. And um, maybe it's because things come fast and furious. There weren't these grand expectations for the future even before even when I was a child I mean things are different today than they were then but a lot of it has to do with the energy that drives the culture around us the uh, energy of course for the most part is energy that comes from the devil and from the flesh that's what energizes the world now I know that there are believers in the world but a lot of things are driven by sin and rebellion, even when it comes to believers. Uh, they're driven by sin and rebellion. I know what the Bible says, but this is what I believe. This is what I think. And people are living by what they believe or what they think, not by what God has revealed to them. And that can be a problem. The Bible calls this the corruption that is in the world or the wisdom of the world. And the wisdom of the world considers what we're doing here tonight utter foolishness. But what we're doing here tonight connects us to the concepts of biblical hope and biblical joy. And if we don't have that, we kind of get off the beam and we start thinking the same way that the world thinks. And so if the world is infused by sinful humanity and, and uh, the fallen nature of people, the devil and all of that, then we have to come to the place where we recognize that as a mass of humanity, we've made a mess of the world and we've made a mess of our own lives. We have to admit that we have. As a believer, we've come to understand that we not only have to fight against our own sin, which is very, very difficult. We have to fight, right? There is an active role. My part is to say no to sin, to put it to death. And I rely upon the Holy Spirit and the Word of God in order to do that. There is no such thing as passive Christianity. God is not going to wave a wand over you all of a sudden. You won't desire your life-dominating sin. You will. And it will rear its ugly head at times when you are stressed or at times uh, when you're, you're, you're struggling in your relationship with other people or with the Word of God. You, you're just going to deal with those times. And, and there will be plenty of things in the culture that will be glad that you're in the place that you're in because there will be this pulling that takes place and you're going to find your hope and your joy in, in those things, the things of uh, Vanity Fair, as Bunyan put it, that pull us away from the Lord. Ed Welch, in his article, summarized the way that culture engages depression in five different ways. First, we, we deal with the culture of decisions, like I've already talked about a little bit. But, but the idea of all the choices that need to be made and that they need to be made now, starting in grade school, it seems. 
comes upon kids fast and furious. And so most of the major decisions that were made generations ago, like I'm talking before the Industrial Revolution, maybe in the World Wars, those were already made for people. Even the idea of who I'm going to marry, there, there wasn't this selection out there that we think of uh, today when you've got the computer and how you can be connected to people through the computer. And, and you know, so the idea was, these are the people that I'm growing up with, the people that I'll probably marry and, and die with. I mean, that was the culture in that particular time. And so that took a lot of stress off. I can even remember when I was a kid, I was involved in my dad's roofing company and I didn't have a worry in my head growing up in Michigan about what I was going to do. I mean, I, I was going to grow up and I was going to take my dad's roofing company at some point when he was ready to retire. That was my plan. I wasn't obsessing about college. Um, I did want to go to college, but it, it just wasn't something that I, I thought I was ever going to do. God changed all of that, of course. But, but for me, I, I didn't have that problem, that struggle. Uh, that I think a lot of kids have today, the struggle over education, who I'm going to marry. I knew I was gonna marry at 12 years old. I really did. Uh, no, 14, she was 12. <laughs> she was 12. So, you know, I think for young people today, all of that stuff is really, really fluid and it's, they struggle with it. And um, that struggle, I think, can lead to just paralysis by analysis, maybe where they, they look at all the choices and decisions that are ahead of them, and they're so worried about making a mistake that they don't make any choices. They don't make any decisions. And so they struggle. Now, what do you do when you're struggling in that area? Well, you have to revisit the sovereignty of God. Do you really believe in the practical application of the sovereignty of God? A lot of people love to talk about God's sovereignty, but they express it in such a way that it's fatalistic. I talk about God's sovereignty, I realize that he's in control and that even when I do make mistakes, now I'm not gonna make mistakes because of this, uh, but even when I do make mistakes, God can still work through those mistakes and even out of the evil thing that I have done, bring good to pass. That's amazing when you really think about it. That's God's sovereignty. So I have made decisions in my life, even currently, that I have regretted. And when I make those decisions that are regretful, I have to remind myself that God is in control and I need to get back on the beam and start doing what he has commanded me to do. So that's what I think Welch is talking about when he talks about the culture of decisions. And then number two, there's the culture of in, the individual. You know, it is true that other cultures, they emphasize community. I mean, we know this with Asian cultures, Filipino cultures in our church, um, cultures in Africa, there's more of a tribal communicate, community uh, effort. People are dependent upon one another. That's not true in America. You know, that's not true with, with people at least that are indigenous to here, except for maybe Amish people. There's a great example of a people that all about community. Now, so in these tribal communities like the Amish people, there's not a high incidence of depression. Well, it shows that in his article. So well, why is that true? Well, because they're, they're in it for everyone else. They're all working together, moving forward. I think that's why it's hard for uh, America to do church right, because it's all about the individual in, in America, and that's, that's a problem. So when, when you're talking about the individual, it's that we're all like-minded, you know, straining forward for the same goal, but, but church is about what I can get, not what I can give. And so when I go to church, I still have that consumer mentality. The individual is consuming, right? He or she bigger than anything else in the world. Even the thinking gravitates around how this is going to affect me, 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 right? Not so much uh, the body of Christ and moving forward with other people. So how do we remedy that? Well, we gotta understand who, again, is in control. God is the king of everything. <laughs> and uh, so we have to submit ourselves to him and we have to do 
life the way that he has revealed that we should do it. And that means giving ourselves away for others. That's where we really find our lives. So we can't be the culture of the individual or the culture of the self-indulgent. That, that kind of uh, overlaps a little bit with the individual. But here you've got people. This is the result of the self-esteem movement. The self-esteem movement has become the self-destructive movement. Self-esteem has never been a good thing. I've even heard Christians say, I'm, I'm concerned about my child's self-esteem. Uh, people in the school have said that to me. And I try to be very patient and teach them that self-esteem is very destructive doctrine, teaching. Problem is, when you tell a child that you are great or you can do anything or you, know, you, you really deserve it or you're the best, that child's going to wake up one day and discover that they are not so great and that they can't do everything. And, and when they're put in that position, then there are only two choices. They get really, really depressed or they enter into denial. And we've met adults that have been through that. They've been reared on that kind of teaching and they are very selfish people. They're hard to get a hold of. They think that the world owes them a living or that they're God's gift to humanity. And so they kind of walk on water and, and people like that are very difficult to work with. People are difficult to reach. People like that are difficult to reach. Then there's the culture of happiness as the greatest good. You gotta think about that. I mean, I, I do believe that God wants us to be happiness in the, happy rather in the blessed state, right? right? Happy are, are those who mourn. Um, they're the ones that are going to be comforted. Well, happiness, as far as what the world is thinking, well, if I think that happiness is the greatest good, then I'm going to see that suffering has no benefit, and I'm going to look to expunge my life of all suffering. What, what's the only problem with that kind of uh, living? You can't do it. Right. Suffering and grief come into your life, and then how do you operate when they do? Well, some people shut down. They become so sad that they can't, they can't operate. And so that's where the depression is connected. So people become so sad that what do they do? Well, they do one of two things. They run away from relationships. Uh, they just dismiss people that they should work. Even family. Family's breaking apart. Or... They're, they're sad and they try to medicate themselves to be happy again. And that's why we have the problem we have with uh, the Oxycontin, is that what it is? Uh, epidemic in our country, where everybody is taking this stuff because they wanna, they, they wanna transport themselves to a happy state. And they find that this is the only way that they can do it. Or the culture of entertainment. That's a big problem for young people. They wanna be constantly entertained. I always chuckle when I hear my wife say, well, you don't have anything to do, be bored. It's good for you. And it's true. When they're bored, then all of a sudden they're planting a garden. Right? You, you, can't, you can't always be doing something or being entertained. Um, the antithesis, of course, to this idea of entertainment is it constantly it is constantly ramped up and needed because of boredom. Boredom uh, kind of is paired with this idea of entertainment. And so they can't find anything new to entertain them. So a lot of young people have been there, done that, bought the t-shirt. And when we were kids, or at least when I was a kid, I didn't try all of that stuff. And it didn't come at me as fast and furiously as it's coming at young people today, especially through the television. And so because of that, uh, they become bored very, very easily. You know, it, it's, it's a problem. So, you know, how do you battle all of these things? Well, I think you battle them with true joy. So joy is often confused with gratitude. Gratitude is not joy. Gratitude still has that, oh, it benefited me. Even if it's a good thing that benefited me, right? It's me. I benefit. And it's good that I'm grateful, but that isn't joy. And joy isn't pleasure either because pleasure is just kind of a surface level thing. When we use the word pleasure, we're talking about that felt good, that was wonderful. All right, well, that's not joy. Now, 
uh, both of those things can kind of coalesce with joy, but we can't define joy in that way because joy is something that is with me even when there's suffering, pain, and grief because of something awful that's happened, like a shooting that, that, that happened today, right? And families that are suffering right now, could those families still have joy and operate in life? The answer is yes, they could. If, if they understood what the biblical concept of joy is all about. And I think it's helpful to think in the way that Ed Welch lays it out in his article, all of these aspects of culture and how they affect us and have led to greater incidents of depression. But we can't leave it there, right? He wouldn't either. The idea is we have to take it a step further and we have to think on the things that God wants us to think on in order to break free of the culture, to change our mindset toward an eternal mindset and, and to think on the things, to meditate on the things uh, that are, are going to lead to the doing of them. In other words, for Paul, it's not just think, all right? In a, in a, it, it's think and then do. One of the best practices that I started, I don't know, maybe about 18 months ago, was just along with my Bible reading, taking a verse, or just even going through topic uh, for a whole week, and thinking about that one thing, just thinking about it for 15 minutes each morning, and then trying to do that in, in whatever way God led me to, um, on that particular day. I think that that's what this verse is teaching. That brings true joy because you see the Bible at work in your life. You meditate and then you do. Notice what Paul says in these verses. Yeah, whatever things are, and then he has a list here, true, and we're not going to go over them tonight, but you, you know, you've heard them. True, noble, just, pure, lovely, good report. These are the virtuous, praiseworthy things. Think on them. And then he says, after you think on them and meditate on these things, remember that these are things that you've learned and you've received. We, we haven't learned and received them from Paul because he's not here, right? But we kind of have because God has preserved Paul's words. But, but really, they're not Paul's words. They're God's words. They're inspired by God. So we learn and receive these things from, from Paul, from God. We, we didn't actually see them in him, but, but we certainly see them in him in all of the books that he wrote in the New Testament and his self-testimony. He says, those things do now. So don't just stop at the meditative level, but do those things that you've been thinking about. And I think that the morning is the best time to think about them, and the whole day is the best time to do them. For some people, it might be the night before is the best time to think about them and then to sleep on that and then to do them the whole next day. However you do it, think on them and then do them. I think that that is precisely the way to joy. I, I really do. And so we realize joy when God is near. And it's during those meditative times, prayerful times hopefully, that God is right there with you. And the, <clears throat> the presence of God leads into joy and peace, joy and power, and joy and protection. And if anything's going to bring me out of depression, it's going to be to know that God has given me peace, not only with himself, but peace in my very soul, knowing that I'm forgiven, always forgiven. And then power because of God's presence being communicated in and through me and then knowing that I am protected. I was thinking about that this morning from Ephesians chapter 1. I am in Christ. That's what makes me valuable. Not, not because I'm chosen as an individual but because I'm chosen in Christ and that I belong to him. That brings joy. I don't think it would bring me any joy if I thought that I was chosen as an individual because I see how rotten that I am. I know me. So I have greater joy because I'm in Christ, not still in myself, foundering. 
So I trust that the, the Lord will use this to bring joy into your own life. And you will realize these three aspects of joy that come along with it. That's why I think people who suffer can remain joyful. Father, thank you for the opportunity uh, that we have to be here. And we know that you are for us, that nothing else can really be against us, and no one else can be really against us if you are for us, that you are with us even right now, holding us by your omnipotent, powerful hand. And so, Lord, we know then what joy is. Help us to refine it in our lives, to think about the word and how it affects our past and, and, and present. Our sins are gone, all of them in the past. And presently, we have a right standing as sons and daughters with you. And we have a future, to be sure, because our citizenship is in heaven. And so, Lord, give us peace, power, and protection in the present. Give us, in short, an eternal quality of life. Help us, Lord, to realize joy. We pray in Jesus' name.